Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you to worship you. And we ask that you forgive your people if we've lived our life in a way that is not all about you and all about us. We want to return, Father, to a worship where it's all about you. So guide our hearts and guide our minds. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to sound a little weird today. Um, not content-wise, <laughs> voice-wise, although I do sometimes say weird stuff. But <laughs> So bear with me today. Um, <clears throat> a little congested, but we are happy to be here, and I'm happy that you guys are here too. God restores worship. The reason why we talk about this is because like we sang this song, and sometimes I think that when we go through these worship songs, it's almost like we could end the service at the end of the songs, right? Like the songs are powerful enough with enough message that we could call it a service, right? Um, but you know, we're so accustomed to having the word. And so we want to talk a little bit more about what that last, last song talks about. We have to work on restoring worship because oftentimes we get into this cycle of making it all about who? All about us, right? Even in any relationship, even in your marriage, right? It's not going to work if it's only about what? Only about you, only about me. Right? So in the very basic level of relationship, when it's only about me, it doesn't work. And to make it work, we also have to give space to make it about who? The other person as well. When it comes to worshiping God, it's all about God who created us. And we're going to understand the importance of that. So we come to Ezra chapter 7. And finally, the person, right, whose name is used as the title of this book is introduced in Ezra chapter 7. And so Ezra chapter 7 focuses primarily on introducing Ezra, not only as someone who helped people move from Babylon to Jerusalem, but he's introduced also as a scribe and as a reformer. A scribe is someone who not only learns the laws, uh, but also is entrusted to teach the law. And a reformer is someone who creates changes to make it better, right? And so Ezra is going to be able to do both of that. And one of the changes that Ezra is going to try to accomplish with the people of Israel is placing God at the center of their worship again. Because they hadn't made God the center of their worship. And so we read in Ezra chapter 7, verse 6 through 10 and 25, says, this Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a scribe skilled in instruction from Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. Moreover, the king gave him everything he requested because the Lord, his God's power, was with him. Some of the Israelites and some of the priests and the Levites, the singers and the gatekeepers and the temple servants also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. They reached Jerusalem in the fifth month in the seventh year of the king. The journey from Babylon began on the first day of the first month, and they came to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was upon him. Ezra had determined to study and perform the Lord's instruction and to teach law and justice in Israel. And you, skipping to verse 25, Ezra, based on the divine wisdom that you have, appoint supervisors and judges to adjudicate among all the people in the province beyond the river who know the laws of your God, you will also teach those who do not know them. A lot of the stories that we find in Scripture, in the Old Testament, a lot of the patterns that we're going to see is that God sets His people free, right? And it's more than just freedom from captivity or exile. God has a purpose. So you have to understand the gospel in terms of freedom from and freedom for. When you look at the basic message of the gospel, right, it's not just freedom from hell or condemnation, but it's freedom also to do what? To enjoy a relationship, an eternal relationship with who? With God, right? And we can go further and talk about freedom from hatred, but now we are freedom to do what? 
to love, right? Freedom from guilt. But now we are free to do what? To show mercy, to have compassion, right? So when we come to the very understanding of the gospel, it's not just God saying, I'm going to set you free from something, but I'm also going to set you free to do something. And that's when, and we miss that because we often focus on what? On the freedom from, right? Oh, God's going to set you free from all your troubles and all of this and that, right? But we forget that there's also the other side of that, but a freedom to do what? To heal. Yes, God will set you free from your illness, but he'll also set you free to do what? To find healing. If you're tired, God's going to say, I'll set you free from what? It's draining your energy, but then I also need you to be free to rest, right? Because oftentimes we do that, right? It's like, oh, God, please, I can't find rest. I can't find rest. Okay, I'll set you free. But know that you are also free to rest. And we often miss that other freedom part. And we feel guilty when we rest, right? And that's not, then that maybe God hasn't really set you free from that. So it's a freedom too. And so freedom from, freedom to. We have to figure out the freedom from and the freedom to, or it's just a cycle. You don't say, I have recovered from addiction if you are free from one addiction and then you just jump to another addiction. It doesn't make sense, right? We have to find what we're free to, what we're free to do as we are called people of God. The biggest story of deliverance in the Old Testament we find in Exodus when the Israelites were uh, slaves in Egypt, right? And there's one interesting piece and it's a constant message throughout the ten plagues, right? When God tells Moses to go deliver this message to Pharaoh, he tells him, and you know this famous line, right? Set my people what? Free, right? He goes in every time, set my people free, set my people free. But we forget the other half of what that message was. And I'm going to repeat it to you. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 14 through 16, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh is stubborn. He, will, he still refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. As he's going out to the water, make sure you stand at the bank of the Nile River so you will run into him. Bring along the shepherd's rod that turned into a snake. Say to him, Lord, the Hebrews, God has sent me to you with this message. Let my people, what? Go. Good job. Let my people go so that they can worship me in the desert. So they can worship me in the desert. Up to now, you still haven't listened. So he's going to repeat that until he finally does listen. And interestingly, you have to understand that it wasn't specifically the geographical location that enabled the people to worship God. It wasn't like the wilderness had something special where they were able to connect with God closer. It wasn't about the geography, but it was more about the journey. It's about the journey. We are people created in the image of God, and we are created to worship God, to honor, to show reverence, great respect. And because of our human free will, God doesn't always end up being the focus of our worship. Sometimes it's another person. Sometimes it's a thing. Sometimes it's an idea that we worship. Or sometimes it's even our own self. Our own self. The people of Israel, in their journey, were about to see how God is going to restore worship in their lives. Because you see, as soon as, they let, as soon as they're free and they're in their wilderness, not too far into maybe the first week, right, when Moses is up in the mountain receiving instructions from God, the people downstairs, well, not downstairs, down in the, at the base of the mountain, right, they are building a what? A golden calf. And Aaron, who should know better, right, is saying, this golden calf is the God who set you free. Can you believe that? And the people believed that, and the people were worshiping who? The golden calf. They had a lot to learn about worship. So it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to set you free from this land of Egypt, but I'm also going to teach you worship. Because obviously, you got a lot to learn. And I can imagine Moses coming down, right, and look and finding, and he was really mad. He came down, and he's like, what in the world are you guys doing? 
Like, when did you guys build this? Right? And I can just see him in his mind, like, oh boy, this is going to be a long journey. <laughs> a long one. Indeed. Because the journey of their wilderness experience, right, from where they were set captive to the promised land, in reality, if you were to walk that, uh, even with plenty of time, it should only take 14 days, the most. If you plan it well, you can walk in 14 days and reach the promised land. How long did it take Israel? 40 years. 40 years for them to understand what the worship of God meant. That's where God began talking about the tabernacle and the importance of the temple and the importance of the sacrificial system. It takes time. It takes time. I'm still learning how to worship God, believe it or not. Because I often find myself other things trying to invade my life or trying to put, take God out of the center of my life. Sometimes I, I just want to do things just for my own self, right? Like, no, God. Ah, oh, yeah, no, but you know what? That's right. It's too selfish. Our priorities and devotion follow our worship. Our priorities and devotion follow our worship. If I love the idea of worshiping self, the priorities and devotion will be centered around my own self. When we replace that worship to God with something else, it doesn't end well. There's something incomplete. There's something meaningless. There's confusion and sometimes even destructive. There will always be that emptiness still. And you have the power, right? to choose what you want to be the center of your worship. When we do decide to worship God, our priorities align, our devotions align and follow God. Our priorities and devotions and our actions, in other words, begin to align to that which defines God or what God requires from us. So in other words, it becomes a priority for me if I worship God to live justly. It becomes a priority in my life to walk humbly. It becomes a priority in my life to love mercy. Micah 6, 8 reminds us, right? He has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you. To do justice, embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. If I truly worship God, I will most likely attempt to reflect who God is. One of the missions here at the Foundry is we reflect Jesus, right? We want to reflect Jesus in our community. What does that mean? It means we have to understand who Jesus is in order for us to reflect that image of Jesus. When we reflect that is when we are saying we are worshiping who? Worshiping God. Because we are aligning our priorities and our devotion and our action to do that. God, we want to honor you by reflecting who you are. We want to worship you by reflecting who you are. We imitate that which we worship. We try to assimilate to that which we worship. We try to be like that which we worship, right? And you, I mean, it can be as mundane as um, sports fans. Right? How many of you like sports? Yeah. So I grew up in an era where um, I used to watch the Chicago Bulls, right? And I was a big fan of him. And no, I was not a fan of Michael Jordan, although I liked him. But I was a fan of Dennis Rodman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dennis Rodman. So bad that even though I wasn't supposed to dye my hair, I dyed my hair, right? <laughs> That's how rad I was, so. Huh? It was orange, yes, it was orange. Uh, I, I don't think there's pictures of that, thank God. But, <laughs> but you have to understand, I, I like... Like, I worshiped that guy. I was like, I wanted, to be, I wanted to be that guy so bad that I started imitating, right? And even in my basketball, right? I mean, not his actions, please. No, I wasn't. <laughs> but um, his game, right? Like, I was just trying to be rough. And I wasn't even big. Like, I think, I think only in the latter, my junior and senior year, that's when I grew. But um, I was, like, always on the shorter side, right? But I'm, like, rebounding and, you know, pretending I'm, like, tough and got six foot tall friends right there who's trying to teach me a lesson but you get the idea whatever you worship whatever you follow you try to do what you try to imitate 
We try and dress like them. We try and wear their jerseys. We try and talk. We get, no, I never got any tattoos. <laughs> uh, we, try and, we try and look that, like them, right? Think about us as people of God who worship God. If they see us, would they say, huh, I can tell you worship God. Would they? Because they could clearly see me if I walk around with a jersey, right? And I have a number 23 back there, right? And I'm like all fitted with Jordan shoes and everything. They're going to think, oh, yeah, you must really like the Chicago Bulls, huh? Right? <laughs> like you can easily pick that up, right? So I wonder, as people of God, who we say we worship God, are our priorities, our living, our choices, our devotion so aligned with God that when someone sees us, they say, wow, I think you worship God. Like I can tell. And that's what we're called as a people. To worship who? To worship God. It becomes a priority to serve rather than be served. It becomes a priority to be set apart for God, to be holy. It becomes a priority to be one it becomes a priority to obey, even when it's difficult. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 8 reminds us, right? Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any sharing in the Spirit, any sympathy, complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united and agreeing with each other. Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility, think of others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Reflect Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God, something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Many Israelites returning to Jerusalem needed their priorities and devotions to align once again to God. Ezra would help lead that. But the importance of this narrative, I want to close with this, is that the location doesn't determine whether worship can be restored or not. Returning to Jerusalem doesn't somehow magically change the people's heart to worship God. By the time Ezra returns, the temple is already built. It's complete. And they're starting to slip downhill again. They're starting to lose focus again. They're starting to make, to repeat that pattern again, right? That got them in exile in the first place. And so Ezra comes with his second group of people to remind them, no, 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 no. Let's not do this again, please. And restore worship in their hearts. But the place doesn't make it somehow magical. This restoration could have easily happened while in exile, and it did happen through other prophets, right? Returning to church also is not going to magically change your heart. It's actually the disposition of the heart to worship God alone that will change your life. Because you can be here every Sunday, but if your heart is not there, it's the point, right? The place is not what makes it the difference. It's your heart and the people of those hearts around you. We can help you belong. We can help you cr by creating this space. But ultimately, it's up to you, right, to let that belonging and that space empower you to worship God alone. We can tell you God should be first. I can tell you, right, like God is this priority and you have to do this and that, but we can't force you to worship. We can't force you to worship. It's something that you have to find, something that you have to figure out. And so I want to invite you every day as we call ourselves people who worship God, how is my priority, how is my devotion, how is my actions, how are my words aligned to who God is? Because it's easy for me to not do that. It's easy for me to not worship God and worship my own dreams or worship my career or worship my family or worship my own self. And we lose track. 
very easily and very fast. But God calls us again and says, no, worship me and you will find life, a full life, a meaningful life, a life that's rewarding because whatever we do it becomes eternal and not just temporary. One of the biggest issues of us human beings trying to worship something outside of God, uh, something outside of God is that whatever we worship outside of God is what? It's very temporal. So it's never enough. It's never enough. Everything outside of God, it's temporal. But go back to God and find that eternal peace that God has created in you. And that's where things start clicking. That's when things start making sense. It's like, oh yeah, now I get it. Now I get it, God. So I invite you to do that as you seek to worship God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. You don't force us to worship you. You invite us to worship you. And what a loving invitation, Lord God. What a loving invitation. And let's just pray as we come to worship you that we would feel and experience the presence of your grace and your mercy and your compassion in our lives. That to worship you, Father God, is to find freedom, the freedom that you want in our lives. And I pray that you give us a strength, strength in us to really look deep inside and analyze our priorities, analyze our life, analyze our motives and our intentions and ask ourselves, Lord, are we truly worshiping you? If people see us, do they say that we worship you? I pray that you restore in your people, in your church, a people that worships you and you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.